This is time for our next speaker. And um, I have to say this, I'm very happy having uh, Carlos today here. Um, I will give you a quick biography of Carlos. Um, as you may read, Carlos will speak about machine learning to estimate wind resource uncertainty. Very, very interesting and important topic in the, the uh, uh, variability of wind. Carlos Morales studied the uh, Bakelers in renewable energy at the uh, Instituto de Energías Renovables with us at the Institute with a high focus on wind energy. After finishing uh, his studies, he worked briefly at the, as a research assistant in projects related to the utility of reanalysis data for wind resource assessment in Mexico in the same institution. Afterwards, he studied the Master of Science in Energy in Wind Energy at the Technical University of Denmark, where he recently graduated defending his thesis work, Machine Learning to Estimate Wind Resource Uncertainty. He's currently working as Wind Energy Engineering Consultant for Rumble Germany in Hanover. So welcome, Carlos, it's a pleasure having you here. And- no, thanks uh, for the invitation. <laughs> Please, everyone, uh, feel free to put your uh, questions in the chat. And um, the flat is yours, Carlos. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, so, well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, my thesis project, which I graduated like a, a two months ago, and it's called Machine Learning to Estimate the Wind Resources Uncertainty. It was under the supervision of Andrea Hammond, a researcher at DTU. So, so yeah, I'll just keep going. Uh, just to, to make you an outline of what, what I'm gonna talk about is, is very briefly described here. So I'll talk about the, the introduction to the topic, uh, the data and methods used, uh, some results obtained, uh, applications of the results and some conclusions and further improvements or further work in, in the project. So, well, uh, I, I, I I would like to 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 tell you that uh, this this project was probably done during five months, so a lot of things will will uh, weren't done as we wanted to, but I'll 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 explain that later. Uh, so, I mean, we we all have more or less of my, the same motivations to to our projects. So we we know that the uh, climate change is is actually a big deal. And it's getting more regular and world spread. So we, we need to, to do some changes, especially in the way we, we produce the energy. And in that regard, uh, renewable energy sources are definitely a, a good idea. And of course, wind energy uh, is, is uh, still, well, it's, it's one of the main uh, resor uh, renewable resources we have with about uh, seven 780 gigawatts as of 2020, so uh, a big share of, of the installed capacity. And despite the, the pandemic and all the, the responses uh, derived by it, there are still a lot of plans on building a new uh, wind capacity uh, of, of about of more than, well, about 500 gigawatts onshore, but also 100 gigawatts offshore by, by 2025. So that's a lot of uh, a lot of new wind farms, and also, I mean, needless to say, but the the wind resource assessment remains a, a basic phase in the wind farm planning process. So without it, it, there are basically no no projects. And as Miguel was telling us, the the wind power is complex, and part of this complexity is that it relies on the atmosphere spheric conditions. So it's heavily dependent on, on, on the side conditions, but also uh, yeah, any, any kind of conditions, orography, climatology, etc. And of course, this, these conditions affect our uh, uncertainty in the assessment. So if we 
have uncertainty in the wind assessment. We have uncertainty in the in the project and in the economical part, and so on and so on. So uh, here I'm showing you. Uh, I think you, can you see my cursor? Sorry, I'm not sure. Well, yes, yes, yes we can. can. Ah, okay, perfect. Yeah, I wasn't sure. And <laughs> well, here here you can see a mesoscale uh, output. Well, output mesoscale model uh for for south africa and and we are well mesoscale models are, are very useful to to assess the the wind uh, however they they have some inherent errors uh we we can say that the 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 resolution both spatial and temporal resolutions aren't uh, the best sometimes um this opens like a, an opportunity to to a statistical based models named machine learning to to improve the models so we we, we can use uh, these models to improve the models <laughs> it's a bit uh, funny uh, and specifically for for this project, uh, what we did is is based in in South African data. So very briefly, I'll I'll explain you why South Africa. So South Africa is uh, as many countries aiming to be net zero carbon emitter, and it already has a, a wind a wind power capacity of two point five gigawatts, and planning to install fourteen point five gigawatts uh, for the next eight years. Therefore, they are founding some, some projects. One of them is the South African Wind Atlas uh, in order to, to map the wind resource over the, over the country and, and support the, 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 well, the planning of new projects. Um, well, uh, the, the good thing about the, this project is that it was uh, a good data set to use. Um, well, of course, it's in this project specifically is for for South Africa, but if it works, it can be applied for other regions. Uh, so the, the objectives of, 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 of the project were was mainly uh, to model the wind speed bias between wharf output data and the observations. So modeling the the uncertainty of the of the models with machine learning. Therefore, we wanted to know if we could use machine learning to, to estimate it. Uh, also, if we can do it with machine learning, which model is best suited for this application? And of course, if we are able to do it, uh, how about doing it over a regional level? In this case, uh, South Africa. Uh, so about the data, uh, it's, it's, of course, uh, from South Africa and the South African Wind Atlas. Um, we were using uh, 19 stations spread about around the country. Um, well, they, they were having different uh, measurement periods. One of, one, some of them had one year only. Some of them had up to 10 years um, during uh, within the last decade, basically. And they had a resolution of 10, 10 minutes, which was for the downscale to 30 minutes to, to be comparable to the work uh, output. And what we got from these stations was a very standard uh, variables from, from MedMass. So the wind speed at, at these levels, the wind direction, uh, and yeah, some atmospheric uh, variables as well. And then uh, the model data, because it's, it's also important to, to say uh, what we were having in the other side. So the, the model data was actually a WARF output uh, from, from the Wind Atlas for South Africa, the, the run number three. So kind of the third iteration of the project. Um, it, it was having the, the same heights and, and the same sites. So we were storing uh, most of the, of the WARF output data in 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 our files uh, to get uh, a data for over thirty years. It had a three point thirty three kilometer resolution, and well, this this uh, mesh uh, for it. Um, 
the, the good thing about uh, using WARF is that we can actually get more variables. Uh, so in addition to the wind speed and the wind direction, uh, uh, we could also store the heat flux and uh, the bulk resource number and inverse overhead length. These two are uh, stability parameters of the atmosphere, which are uh, very useful sometimes to, uh, especially for 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 making predictions, more accurate predictions based on, on the state of the atmosphere. Uh, so what we can see is that we were using this domain. Just, just to be clear. And also, uh, I, I, I want to say that uh, the WARF simulations weren't part of, of this project. So we were uh, just using the, the output data directly uh, well after filtering and, and everything. Um, so how, how similar were, were these uh, two data sets? Uh, here is just one example, probably not for the best station, but that's good uh, for explaining purposes. So uh, this was sort of our station with the worst behavior, let's say. And what we are seeing here is a, well, the, the, the mean wind speed uh, at this station over, over the, 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 the year and also during the day. So what we can say is actually that even when, when this station wasn't the best, I mean, probably, uh, you'll see later on. Uh, what we can see is that they resemble each other. So uh, it's not that we were having complete different data sets. And of course, some other uh, uh, evaluations were done, but I, I'm not uh, showing them here. Um, one thing the, that made this station a bit uh, complicated is that it was in a very complex uh, region. So uh, it was over here. I mean, we have a lot of mountains in, in this part of, of South Africa. So, yeah. And continuing with this comparison uh, between the data sets, uh, we can see here the, the, probability, the probability distribution functions of the wind speed. Um, well, they, they are also uh, very similar, uh, as you can see here. Um, a, a problem with the with the wind direction uh, wind directional distributions is that in the case of this station we, we can see a, a kind of multi-directional behavior which made it a bit difficult to to tell if they were similar or not in in other, for in the case of other stations it was clear but yeah it, we, we can maybe say that northeast uh, sector is the predominant but yeah not really um i i'm also including here a just a brief comparison of the of the wind speed bias uh, for all the sites this is between wharf and the output uh, how i'm here we could say ah, well the, the station number 10 didn't have any bias uh, but this is the the mean bias so probably it's a bit uh, misleading. However, we can see that, of course, it changes uh, among each uh, of the sites. And well, uh, I will just briefly explain this evaluation metrics. Uh, evaluation metrics, so for those who doesn't know, uh, are very important to to know if your machine learning model is actually doing something or not, so to evaluate them. And in this case, we would use uh, were two very simple ones, the mean absolute error, which is just the, the mean of the error over our predictions. But the, the other one is the earth movers distance or EMD, which basically evaluates the difference between two statistical distributions and yeah, it's funny because it, it's called like that because we want to move Earth, uh, let's say, from one distribution to the other, and and the Earth moved from one to the other is is the value of this uh, metric. And well, the the machine learning uh, models that we used were 
basically four in the beginning. So, so we did uh, firstly a test uh, with these four models, uh, basically based on, on studies for wind power for casting applications, which was the most similar application we, we could find. Um, what we used uh, was the artificial neural network and these uh, different uh, tree-based uh, models, all of them do, uh, with the implementation of the scikit-learn Python package. And here I put in bold uh, these two models because those were lately used in well after evaluating them, but. We, we use them with the default the library parameters in the beginning, just to, well, to, to test them before really working hard with them because uh, machine learning is a very computationally expensive uh, process. So sometimes uh, you don't want to waste your, your time uh, making some calculations. And as you can see, the, the ANN has these values um, as I told you before, the other three are uh, very similar in their default uh, parameters because they basically have the, the same uh, architecture in the model. I, I won't explain the architecture, but yeah. So uh, as part of the results of this uh, first testing of, of four models, so we did a a single fitted model per site. So we actually were fitting 19 uh, models over South Africa, all of them with a five-fold cross-validation. So basically we were, uh, we were picking the data, uh, well, splitting the data in, in five. And wait, I'm, I, I'm getting confused with this. I'll just keep it. Uh, but we, what we were using is uh, randomly shuffled data. So basically we were disregarding the, the time continuity and we were just uh, uh, making predictions. So what you see here is not a time series, it's just yeah, a, a comparison of, of what we were getting. Um, a train test data splitting of 0 0.8, 0 0.2. And what we were using to as predictors were uh, these variables. Uh, which were coming from WARF alone. So if it wasn't clear before, what we wanted to do is uh, to have the WARF output and use it alone to estimate the uncertainty of the WARF, WARF wind speed alone. So, so that we don't depend on, on, on metmasts, at least in, in a further uh, stage, because of course we need them to, to, to validate the, the, the predictions. And here in bold, you have the, the parameters used in, in our base case, but what we were using are these variables. So the wind speed, again, the wind direction, uh, the wind shear, temperature, the bulk resource number. And of course, even though we were disregarding the, the time continuity, we need to, to keep the hour and the month uh, of each of the data points. Otherwise, yeah, it's super difficult to, to make predictions and they are nonsense. Um, uh, well, what we are trying to predict is the wind speed bias. So basically the, the wind speed predicted by WARF minus the, the wind speed uh, observed. Um, yeah, what we were getting, this is just kind of a teaser. Is, is something like this. This is not a time series. So yeah, don't, don't get confused about that. Uh, so just, just to make uh, things simpler, I'm only showing you the, the ART results, which were kind of our best results in this uh, base case. Um, and basically what we can see is that, uh, of course the, the, the orography, uh, plays a, a, a large role in, in the machine learning predictions because our mean average error <coughs> is definitely a, a, well is definitely higher in, in more more complex terrain so what we were having the mountains here also this even when it's nearly sure it's super complex so so that's uh, the problem and more or less, we can say that uh, it's the opposite for, for the 
for the more simpler uh, side. So here is super flat and we are getting uh, better results. A good thing about uh, the ERT and of course machine learning is that, oh, sorry, is that uh, you can actually see uh, which part of the results, well, what, what, which of the variables account for, for more of the influence in the in the results and um, and well we, we there's no surprise that the, the wind speed is is commonly the most important predictor but it also depends on on the location and the model just here i'm only showing you one of the models um, and of course uh, in this case the ERT shares are very well fairly distributed so I mean we, we, we can see that they're kind of similar and, and that's uh, good because we don't want uh, them to be highly dependent on a single variable otherwise the, the rest aren't very important for their predictions. Uh, however uh, uh, here we can see a comparison between the, the four models um, and you can see that the ERT and the random forest regressor uh, are the ones with the <clears throat> with the best uh, performances, let's say, and in both the MAE and the EMD. However, let's let's take into account that it's a bit tricky to to state this because they are only using the default hyperparameters, so it's not like a rule that ERT is going to be always uh, the good one or 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 these two, the GBT or the ANN are going to be the, the worst. Uh, so just just don't 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 get tricked by, by that. However, a good thing is that uh, across sites, the MAE value uh, doesn't change considerably. So so that that shows some consistency in our in our predictions and we can of course say that uh, a good mae value is related to a, a good emd value so the, the the error if the error is lower the distribution uh, in the end is also lower so so that's generally good uh, here's a summary of, of the different uh, cases that we were uh, trying to run and the results I was showing you were for the default case, so basically this one, and you can see that they don't change considerably, and given that we just decided to keep these default uh, values because adding more, more variables and just changing some things there uh, wasn't giving considerably better results, but of course they were uh, making the, the process more, more expensive. Uh, therefore, uh, we kept uh, the ERT and the ANN to, to a further stage of, of, the, of the machine learning analysis, let's say. And of course, we were choosing the ERT because it was the best performing one, but we just decided to, to choose the ANN as well because it had a different architecture. Uh, even though we, we, I was telling you that it didn't have the best results, of course, but we just wanted to, to test them as well. Okay. So in this case, what we did is a single model. So basically... Can you... Someone... Well, I don't know. Um, so basically fitting a single model instead of 19 different models. And uh, because we were having then a lot of data, well, considerably a lot of data and we, we did it in a halving grid search. So basically randomly choosing or well, uh, evaluating the, each of these combinations with a few results and keeping the, the ones with the, the better uh, performances and then evaluating them again, again, until we were reaching a final winner, let's say. Uh, and we also tested uh, two different data sets. So basically using all the data, which means that probably there were some over representations of, of some stations. Um, 
but also we did a one which was taking only 20,000 data points per station because that was the minimum amount of, of data for, well, the maximum amount of data for, for one of the stations. So to, to give it a fair comparison. Uh, and well, some general aspects that we found is that the ERT of course was faster, but it also required more memory than the ANN. And yeah, the other way around for the ANN. Um, uh, uh, yeah, just a, a brief note, the, the metric value, so the MAA, MAE, and the EMD uh, are going to decrease because now we are being less specific in, in, into the information uh, fed to our model. Uh, so they will increase a bit. And here are the, the results for both of them. And yeah. Uh, as you can see, the, the, the values increased a bit, but not considerably, uh, considering that we are uh, now using all the data well, from all the stations. And what we can say is that for the ERT, it was actually better to, to, to use all the data. Uh, sorry. Um, and the EMD decreases uh, for the ERT as well. Uh, however, in the case of the ANN, uh, well, in, using all the data didn't uh, bring uh, considerable changes. So, so we are, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna show you uh, two specific stations. Uh, where we uh, were evaluating them and just just to to see what was happening uh, with the predictions so in this case uh, the station number four uh, if i go back to to the map just to show you where was it uh, station number four was here this was uh, basically in a in a non-complex site and it gave the, the, the bare results in, in our predictions. And what we can see is that actually the, the wind speed uh, bias predicted is, is very similar to, to the observed one. I mean, again, we have the, the diurnal seasonal cycles here, well, means here, but also we have the, the, the distribution here. And we can see that, of course, the, the the fitted distributions aren't exactly the same, but we we see some some resemblance there. So uh, we we can say that yeah, of course these these predictions were helped by the characteristics of the site, and in the end, uh, just to compare with the next uh, station, we got an MAE of one point two one and an EMD of zero point five five. So in the case of this one, uh, this increased um, as well as the EMD. And what we have here is that the, the, the site is, is, is located in a more complex area. So topographically complex, of course, with a higher roughness. Uh, we can see it here. And as you remember, it didn't have a predominant directional sector, which might also have influenced in this probability to, to reproduce the wind speed bias. So what we have is that the, the, in, in the reality, the, the extremes are more common than in our predictions. And we can also see that in our, in our distributions here, which fail to, to predict the, the extreme values. And they are uh, different, well, considerably different to, to the wind speed bias observed. Uh, so all, all this uh, machine learning, uh, of course, has some applications. And what we are aiming is to do some wind speed bias uh, maps, um, well, wind speed and bias maps. So wind speed uh, maps, of course, are, are, are already uh, used. And you basically use the WARF output and then map it over an area as it is here in this case. Um, 
And well, uh, what we want is is to put together this this wind speed uh, with a wind speed bias map uh, to to give some extra information about uh, this. So what we want to, to tell is how how is the uncertainty depending on on the on the area. So how does it changes uh, along the the surface, but also how does it change over the time, which is uh, very important. Uh, that's also good because wharf simulations can be done over a very uh, large spatial uh, area, but also over a long uh, temporal span. And we can re retrieve a lot of information. In this case, this is just a very uh, simple example. So what we, we got uh, using the, the best uh, fitted model in our, in our machine learning uh, model, uh, just for a single day, we are just mapping the uncertainty. So the wind speed bias, sorry, uh, uh, over South Africa and we, we were getting this. So, what this means is that uh, over these red areas, the, the wind speed uh, from wharf is over predicted. I'm oh, sorry, sorry, under predicted. And the, the, the opposite for, for these areas, which are mainly super flat and, and so on. So here we, we have over prediction of, of the wind speed by wharf. And then, of course, we, we can not do it only for a single day, but for months. Uh, in this case, uh, we have uh, four different months. Let's say each of them is representative for, for the seasons. Um, of course, we, we can detect some, some changes of the, of the wind speed bias over, over the, the year. So some some conclusions uh, about uh, the project is that well the the ERT was in this case our best fitted model and of course not only fitted but it was tested and it resulted to be the the best uh, model uh, both uh, using all the data uh, available and the, the default uh, predictors. And um, well, these, these predictions gave the, the following metric values for, for, for us, which was um, MAE of 1.42 in average and an EMD of 0 0.76 in average. And um, well, uh, just going back to our question of, Oh, well, where was our question? Yeah. Uh, is it possible to do it with machine learning? Uh, well, yeah, it, it seems to be possible. Um, well, which machine learning based model uh, is best suited for this application? Apparently the ERT uh, with its pros and cons, of course. And well, is it possible to estimate it over a regional level? Uh, definitely was possible. We can see it here. Uh, of course, we would have liked to, to do this over a longer a time span, but uh, yeah, there were some time constraints that couldn't be allowed us to do that. Uh, we can also say that uh, this method uh, resulted in uh, very advantages. Um, yeah, we consider that it can be replicated in, in other regions where we have the uh, same data available. So for instance, with the Mexican wind atlas, we, we could do the same or, uh, or so. Uh, as long as we have like good quality data, we, we could uh, to try to, to, to do this in other uh, regions. Uh, some good things uh, about our machine learning estimations is that it gave us a consistent, uh, consistent maps over, over the time. And 
and of course no 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 crazy results that look like uh, garbage which sometimes might be the case with machine learning applications um well uh, as i was telling you this map is not the final version a, a final version might be considerably better uh, so over a longer time period or yeah including other other things mm, we 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 got uh, however uh, one uh, main drawback let's say and it's that uh, of course the machine learning uh, models are based on what worf does and worf still has some problems with the uh, modeling with the wind where we have a complex to topography so yeah i mean even though worf has a higher resolution that run than analysis data let's say we're still dealing with with some 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 problems there and well of course mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Carlos. Yep. We are a bit over the time. I think it will be good to stop you here because I can yep. see there are Sounds some good. questions. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm basically done. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so I'm sorry to interrupt <laughs> you like this, Carlos. But okay. So, what I can see in the chat is that uh, Paola Castolo is asking that. Thank you for the speak. And uh, she didn't listen clearly, but uh, uh, which software did you use for modeling the databases or which ones do you recommend? And everyone, please, if you feel free to uh, open your microphone or raise your hand to ask Carlos a question. Uh, please, Carlos. Well, uh, for the data sets, basically, hmm, if I get the yeah, for the data sets, basically the observations, well, those are metmas, so no software there. We, we have the data, we filter it, we, we clean it and, and so on in order to, to be properly used in, in, in our machine learning uh, study. Uh, from the modeling, so WARF, W-R-F, uh, it's a very common, uh, yeah, uh, how's the, it's not a, well, it's a, it's not microscale. Well, it's my, my mesoscale uh, program, well, software to to simulate the, the atmosphere in, in, in some regions. And well, in, it's also becoming very popular for wind energy applications. And so that's the other source uh, for the data sets. And of course, for the machine learning is just Python and scikit-learn, which is very popular for machine learning as an implementation. Thank you very much, Carlos. And uh, anyone has an additional question, please, can you raise your hand? Uh, if you want to, can you write the question in the chat? Um, Okay, thank you, says uh, uh, Paola. Yes, we have a question from Gustavo Hernandez. Hi, Carlos, very nice talk. Can you talk about how did you choose the relevant variables to train your models? Yeah, I mean, uh, as I was uh, telling you, uh, ba -ba -ba, probably it's also good to, well, it was, well, we based is a lot of our decisions uh, on kind of similar applications. So, well, this this article was was very useful for one, and I, I, of course it was for wind power forecasting applications, which is a more common problem. But we, we based our decision of, on which variables to were relevant uh, for this and this. But also there was some some sort of problems because uh, the worth uh, output data was stored and we wanted to use some other variables that weren't stored. So yeah, that was a problem because you, you don't do these 30 year uh, runs over South Africa very well, like in five minutes. Uh, I think you know that very well. <laughs> so 
yeah, those were basically our, our main uh, decision drivers. Thank you, Carlos. So if there are no more questions, I want again to thank Carlos, uh, you have your contact. Everyone has his contact. You can reach us to reach him if you want to. Very interesting uh, topic indeed. Uh, so there is the Carlos email.